Uh, welcome to this lecture, a brief introduction to computer networks. My name is Thomas Ivarsson, and I'm currently employed at the informatics department here at the Linnaeus University. But when I was hired, I was hired to teach computer science and more specifically computer networks. So I guess that is why Jakob asked me to come here today and talk a little bit about this. And this lecture, if you have access to the schedule, is I've been given two lectures, but I, I am treating it as, as one lecture in three parts. So we, we will have a lot of different numbers here to work with for these, I guess, three hours or something like that. And I will begin with who is who in computer networking. We will get the basic vocabulary so we understand one another. And then I will talk about the open system interconnection reference model. So we have even more to talk about um, common references. And then at the end, we will look at some TCP IP protocols that might be of interest for you. But we'll get there on Wednesday, I hope. We start with who is who in computer communication. And we will start with some Latin words. And funny enough, almost all the words you find in computer communication, all the basic words have Latin roots. So that's good to know. And then we will have even more words. And we will finish with a general communication system or a model of a general communication system. That is my interpretation of the transmitter receiver model in the syllabus. So here are some Latin words that we should know. We do not need to know the Latin words, but they have Latin roots. The first one is communication. And communication has to do with the mutual exchange. In our situation, we often talk about the exchange of information between two animals or between animals and machines or between machines. And that leads us to our second word, information. Um, and that's, that's a bit complicated, that word, so I will not go into too much detail about it. We will reconnect with it later. But it has to do with giving something, or it can have to do with giving. And then we have the weirdest word of the Latin words, I think, codex, which later became codex, and that you now know as code in this context, code. And code has to do with something, with symbols that has meaning. And this is very important. Now you are probably programmers, most of you, so you're familiar with computer code. And that is pretty much the same thing. In this case, we are working with different codes. And we often call this code data a specific instance of the code. And sorry about that, data is the last word. The root for data is the last word, datum, which is the noiter of datus, that which is given. And then we have medium, that which is between. And to see if you understood this, we here have a picture. And I want you to take a look at this picture and try to figure out what is communication, what is the information, what is the code, what is the data, and what is the mean medium in this picture. Communication is probably the thing that the person on the left is trying to convey to the person on the right, and that is that there is some large cat behind him. That is the communication. That is the sharing of information. And as we can see, it is somewhat successful. The information is the same thing. The information is that the cat or lion is behind the man. That is the information, and the communication is trying to convey that information from the person on the left to the person on the right. 
Now, if we were looking at this from a communication perspec perspective, uh, this would be a uh, somewhat failed communication because I do not think that the person on the right is trying to convey a cute little kitten. But what is the code here? What is the code? The code is the word choice, the grammar, the syntax of that which is spoken. There is a cat behind you. That is the code. Or the English language in this case, perhaps. Because there is a cat behind you is the data. That is a specific instance of the code. And the medium, of course, is the air between the persons that carries the sound waves from the mouth of one to the air of the other, although he has no ears in this picture. There are a couple of other interesting words. Message, source, and destination. Once again, message is just another word for the data in the previous picture, the information that we want to transmit. The source is the one who, who wants to transmit this information to someone else, and this other one, this other else, is the destination. So the source, in this case, here and now is me, and I seem to have a message, although it's not quite clear, and the destination, of course, is all of you. And if we take this picture again, what would be the message, who is the source, and who is the destination? Well, the message is the thing that makes the communication meaningful. So it's the idea that there is a lion behind the right person. There is a cat behind you, is the specific message. And the source is, of course, the person who says this, and the destination is the person about to be eaten. These words are important. If you, if you deal with computer networks or computer communication, these words are important. Source, destination, and message. They will come again and again. And we are not done there yet. Five more words. Transmitter, the thing that sends out the message. We have the signal, that is the physical representation of the message. When I speak in this room, the sound waves are the signal. We have the channel, and that is the thing that carries the signal from the transmitter to somewhere else. And then we have noise, anything that affects this signal while traveling from the transmitter to the receiver. And the receiver is the thing, the air or the technical thing in the other end that can take this signal and turn it back into a meaningful message. So once again, we look at the picture and we ask ourselves, what is the transmitter, channel, signal, and receiver? And can we identify any noise in this picture? Now, in this case, it can get a bit tricky, but we will try. I would say there, to make this picture function in the next step, that the transmitter is the mouth of the person to the left. And the channel is the air between them. And the signal is, of course, the sound waves, waves created by the vocal cords and the mouth of the person to the left. And the receiver is the non-existing ears on the person to the right. But can we identify any noise here? Well, if we look at it from a mechanical perspective, no, we cannot. It could be noise, for example, if the lion is roaring, that would perhaps affect the ability of the receiver to catch the individual words or the whole sentence. And if we want to move it to a more abstract level, some form of noise might be present here. Uh, since the resulting message is not the intended one. But is that really noise? That might be pushing it a bit. But now we know enough to move into a more 
computer science friendly model. And that is Shannon's schematic diagram of a general communication system. This one is from the 40s, I think, but it holds still to get today, especially for the kind of communication we work with when we have computers. To the far left, we have an information source. That is the thing that wants to transmit the message. And the source then hands this message over to the transmitter that forms it into a signal that can be sent over the channel. And in the middle of the channel, this signal gets mixed with some sort of noise. And that might change the signal. So the received signal, when it comes to the receiver, might not be exactly the same as the signal sent from the transmitter. And depending on how much change has occurred, it might be able to recreate the original message, or it might not be. And of course, what Shannon, what the, Shannon was interested in was showing how can we recreate this signal and how much noise can we accept before we have to turn this away. For this course, for this situation, we only need this model to understand who is the source, who is the transmitter, what happens at the channel, who is the receiver, and what is the destination here. And this might help us when we analyze communication, um, and when we are trying to figure out what is wrong. So this model helps put things into place. And when we then move on into especially the third part of this lecture, having these words, and knowing what they mean, especially source destination, will help immensely, I think. Now, before we leave this who is who section, we're going to look at one more thing. And this is some modes of communication. When computers communicate, they do it with different message types, at least in the TCP IP. So we have the unicast message. And the unicast message is a message that is sent from one source to one destination, and only one destination. Then we have the broadcast message. And the broadcast message is also sent from one source to every possible destination. And if we look at IP communication, that is every destination within the same local network. That is the broadcast message. And then we have multicast, and, and that's a special one, a tricky one. Once again, it goes from one source, and it goes to any destination who are expecting to receive this message. So multicast, when implemented in IP, has to do with the destinations subscribing to this channel or to this specific IP address. And then it's up to the network to be able to deliver this. And if, if the network is not set up to deliver it, it will treat it more or less at broadcast, as broadcasts on the local network. And if you're not with, familiar with the local network and stuff like that, we're going to talk a little bit about that when we go through the open systems in the connection reference model. And the last one, and I'm only using it here to say that such a thing exists. The last one is the Anycast message. The Anycast message is a message from one source, again, to the most suitable destination. And this is one destination, but it could be several. And that's a, that's a tricky thing. It's up to the network to deliver this message to, to a destination chosen by the network based on the IP address. So we could have a service that's located at different uh, locations in the network, spread out. We have several servers, for example, listening, providing this service. And we pro provide one IP address, and the network makes sure that any message to this IP address is delivered to the most suitable server, the closest one, for example. And I have three beautiful pictures 
asking you to think about what type, what mode of communication is this? What mode of communication is the upper left? What mode of communication is the upper right? And what mode of communication is the lower left picture? Each circle is a node or a, a computer, and each white node receives or sends the mes message. The sender is always the one at the left part of the picture, for example. Now the first one, the message goes out from the node in the upper left and it goes to every other node in this network. So that should be a broadcast message. In the upper right, the message goes to several destinations but not every destination, so this should be a multicast message. And the last one, either unicast or any cost, but most likely it's unicast. And that's it for the first part. And due to technical difficulties? Oh, no, no, no technical difficulties. Uh, just have one question. If uh, with any cost, there's only one source and one destination, but you don't actually know the destination when you send the message. Or exactly. There could be several possible destinations, but only one of them will receive the message. Good question. Then we are done with part one, and I don't think we will take a break, since things seems to be going the wrong way when we break. So maybe we will finish early instead. We then move on to part two, the open systems interconnection basic reference model. Um, this model was created, well, the work started at least in the 1970s when business realized that networks or networking is fun, it might be the future, and everyone was creating their own protocols and their own standards for communication, which meant that if I bought one computer from one manufacturer and then I bought a computer from another manufacturer, they would not talk to one another. And while we see some providers still trying that out, in the 70s, they realized this is not a good model. And so a bunch of organizations and telecommunication companies uh, came together and said, let's make an official standard for computer communication that allows different com computers to talk to one another. Uh, and this was done in parallel with the research that, uh, that resulted in TCP IP. And we will see in the next part some difference in that, but this model is used mostly in education. It's a great way to, to conceptualize computer networking, computer communication to understand different aspects of, of what is involved and what is needed. Um, but it's not that heavily implemented, to be polite about it. It's a conceptual model of seven layers stacked on top of one another, of course. And an entity at one level communicates with entities at the corresponding level at the other end. That means that if one computer is communica communicating with another computer, the different layers communicate with only entities in the same layer at the opposite end. Uh, but we'll come back to that in another slide that might, might help explain it. This is what the model looks like. It's numbered from the bottom up. So the lowest level is level one, layer one, and the top layer is layer seven. And we will try to fill, this, fill these in, hopefully before lunch. If we look in one system, and here we have layer two, as the focus point, layer two provides functions for layer three. So each layer provides functions for the upper layer, the layer above it. Every layer except the seventh layer. But the seventh layer provides functions for the application. So it sort of provides functions. And each layer uses functions from the lower level layer, the layer below it. 
So the second layer uses functions provided by the first layer. And of course, the first layer is only a provider. If we have two systems, then each layer communicates with the corresponding layer on the other system. So the third layer entity, the thing implemented in the third layer in the left system, communicates with the thing implement, implemented in the third layer on the system to the right, and only with these. And this is good to keep in mind. It could also be, which I unfortunately have no slides that show, that if I am using a computer here at the Leonidas University campus in Kalmar, and I am communicating with a computer in England, my computer communicates the seventh layer with the seventh layer in the, in the computer in England, and the sixth, and the fifth, and the fourth, and the third communicates both with the, with the destination system, but also with a lot of systems in between, and the same goes for the second layer and the first layer. So only the four upper layers are reserved for communication between the intended source and destination, and lower down, we might have several sources and destinations. Not just the one that I want to communicate with, but my computer needs to com communicate with another computer that needs to communicate with another computer that needs to communicate with another computer in order to deliver this message to the final computer. That's quite complicated, and I've seen a lot of students not understanding that. So we take it from the beginning and ask ourselves, we have two computers here. One computer needs to convey a message to the other computer. What is the most basic thing we need here? What is, what is the most basic thing we need for this communication to work? Now, if we think back to the first part, there was source. There was a destination, or there was a transmitter, there was a receiver, and there was something in between. And that is the most basic thing we need. We need a medium, we need a channel. We need something that can take this message from one computer to the other computer. Else we will only be talking to ourselves. Now, these functions are specified in the first layer, the physical layer. If we are connecting our computers with a copper cable, then the standard specified in the physical layer will detail how, this, how the wire should be placed into the connectors, how a, a signal should be coding ones and zeros. Everything is specified in the physical layer. If we are using radio waves, then wave modulation, everything is specified in the physical layer. And if we don't have the physical layer, then we won't have any intercomputer communication. I'm not a fan of the physical layer, so we skip forward to the next layer we need, the data link, data link layer. And the data link, link layer controls the medium. So here we find a software that, that helps us to, to control the medium. And we find some other interesting stuff here as well. We find carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. Now if we connect several computers to the same communication channel, what will stop these computers from communica communicating at the same time and thus mixing the signals, creating noise for one another? Well, basically nothing. If we connect 10 computers to the same medium, all 10 could start communicating at the same time. Think about 10 people in a room. They might be talking at the same time, or they might be talking uh, one at a time. Ten people in a meeting, hopefully it's only one person at a time talking. 
And if several are talking, not everyone will hear what that person says or the nine other people, not all nine might hear what the other person says. And it's the same thing here. In carrier sends multiple access with collision detectum, CSMA slash CD, the computers detect that someone else is talking. So if I want to talk, I first listen, is, is anyone talking? No. Okay, then I start sending my signal. But if someone else was listening previously and no one was talking and they start sending at the same time, well, I keep listening when I send my signal. And if someone else starts talking, I stop or I, I send a message, I send a jam signal, and then I wait a while and then I try again. This is perfect for copper medium where everyone will hear everyone else. But what if we have a wireless network? We have an access point in the middle and then we have 10 computers in a circle around that one. It could be that computers opposite one another will not detect the signal of the other computer. So two computers could be sending, transmitting at the same time without realizing it. And then we use Carrier sends, carrier sends multiple access with collision avoidance. In this case, we have the access point in the middle. So each computer who wants to send a message asks the access point, is it okay, can I send my message? And if it's okay, the access point says yes, and it will send its message. So these are two ways of treating uh, multiple access mediums depending on what problems, what specific problems they present. So if you, if you ever come in contact with these abbreviations, you now know what they mean, sort of. And here, <coughs> to, to reconnect with something you might have more knowledge about, MAC addresses. We find them here. And MAC addresses we find in the Ethernet protocol. So we have Ethernet frames. And this has to do with the local link. If two computers are connected to the same medium, they are connected to the same local link, and they might be using Ethernet for communication. And this also gives us the scope of Ethernet and the scope of the data link layer uh, protocols. They work on a local link. If you have a switch, and you connect 10 computers to that switch, and that switch is not configured in any way but to work as a switch to move data packets between, or Ethernet frames between computers, they will all be connected to the same local link. If you connect a gateway to the switch, a gateway that will take local, uh, take packages, messages, frames from this network and put it on the internet, that gateway will be the end of that local link. And that gateway will be connected to two local links. One where we find the 10 other computers and one that leads to the internet. And any ethernet frame created on the local link with the switch will not travel any further. It will then need to be remade into another ethernet frame, for example, and sent on to the internet. So the local link ends at the gateway in this case. But then we have a problem here. What if these two computers want to communicate, but there is an internet between them? There is a cloud between them. So the left one is connected to local link A, and the right one is connected to local link B. How would we solve this? Well, we move on to the third layer in the open systems interconnection reference model the network layer. And in this layer, we find interesting stuff such as routing protocols. Routing protocols helps the network know, know where everyone is. And we might find end-to-end -end encryption so that my computer, regardless of the application, will send encrypted messages to the receiver. And we find the famous IP addre addresses in this layer. This layer is what makes it possible to move messages from one local link to another local link. This is what makes the internet. 
If we didn't have this layer, we would only be communicating with computers connected to the same local link. You would only be talking to computers in your own apartment, for example. Or we might build a nice network here in this building at campus in Kalmar and we could talk to one another and it would be great and we wouldn't have to worry about all the dangerous stuff out there on the internet. But we would of course also lose out on a lot of interesting and fascinating stuff. So anytime a message needs to go from one network to another network, and the network in this case is a local link, then we need a network layer. So then I have two questions here. The first one, do we use network stuff in this situation when they are connected with a medium between them, they are the same local link? And do we need network layer stuff here? So do we use it? And do we need it? And the answer to the first question is yes. We use network layer stuff here, layer stuff here. Even if we connect these two computers to the same local link and we use TCP IP, I should add, then we will use network layer stuff here, even though we really don't need it. So the answers are yes and no. So that's the network layer. Data link layer, responsible for the physical medium and for the communication on the local link, and the network layer, responsible for carrying messages between a network. And those might be in between the sender and receiver as I perceive them as a system user. And now we move in to the layers that work between the two end systems, as they might be called. Between my computer and the computer I want to communicate with. All the computers in between, they are just there to help me. I don't care about those today. And there we have the transport layer. And the transport layer does a lot of funny things. It, for example, or protocols, I should say, found in the transport layer might have different ideas about what services to provide to facilitate different kinds of communication. So we might have connection-oriented protocols or connectionless protocols. And in TCP IP, we can use uh, transmission control protocol, TCP, or user datagram protocol, UDP. And TCP is connection-oriented, and UDP is connectionless. So in the connection-oriented example, the sending computer, or the one who initiates the connection, is trying to make sure that it actually can establish a connection here, and that it can maintain this connection. And if this connection is not established and maintained, no data will be sent. If it's connectionless, like UDP, it will only send the data and hope that there will be someone at the other end who will receive it. We also have message segmentation here. If a message is too big to be sent in one message over the network, if the network accepts 150 bytes and the message is one megabyte uh, big, then it will need to be uh, segmented into smaller messages and each message will be sent on its own. And that's the transport layer that should uh, handle this and also then make it possible to put it together at the other end in the right order. Once again, when we look at it from an implementation pers perspective, you might skip that part. You might just segment it or just send it and hope that someone will put it together. You might have error handling if there's some problem with the communication. And you might have flow control. You will find that in TCP, for example. That if, if the, the, the uh, transport layer protocol might realize that this, this connection is uh, congested and we need to slow down a bit in order for it to function properly. 
And then we move into two layers that are interesting, but uh, that present some problems when trying to put uh, TCP IP protocols into this model. We have the session layer. It establishes, manages, terminates uh, connections. So if you have a connection-oriented protocol, or actually, it, I, I should say that in this model, it doesn't matter. The session layer protocol will make sure that we establish the connection, that we can handle it, uh, manage it. Perhaps if there's some, uh, some disruption, it might be able to reconnect, and that it will be terminated in a, in a good fashion. Um, so this seems like a function in the transport layer when you look at the connection-oriented and the connectionless uh, protocol there. But then you have the session layer that provides these functions as well. And I think this is where the model becomes a bit burdensome. Now, when you establish connections, you can also establish the duplex of the connection. And the duplex is important, and, and this is actually a word that you can uh, come back to in other layers as well, especially in the physical layer, or the data link layer that operates on it. And you have three modes of duplex used here. You have the uppermost, simplex. And simplex allows one uh, computer to communicate messages to the other one, but the other one has no means of replying. That's a simplex. So the communication goes in only one direction. In the middle, you find half duplex. And in half duplex, either the left computer or the right compu commu computer can send a me message, but they can't send them at the same time. So if you think back to CSMACD, for example, there you have the half duplex problem. Only one computer can communicate at a time. And if someone is talking, I need to be silent. So that's half duplex. Today, you most often find the last uh, duplex, full duplex, where both compu computers can communicate at the same time, all the time. It doesn't matter if the left computer is communicating because the right one can communicate also. Um, so simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. And then we have another rarely interesting, rarely used layer, the presentation layer. This provides the context for the application entity, for the thing that we find in the last layer. So this might have to do with encoding, for example. And if we have different encodings in the different systems, the presentation layer should be responsible for the translation. And then we find the last, the top layer, the application layer, the most interesting layer, perhaps, at least for developers. So this is where, this is where the application will get access to the network. The application that you create gets access to the network through the application layer. But please note that the application is not what you find in the application layer. So the application that you use is not the same thing as the application layer. These are two different things. If you are surfing the web, then what is the application layer entity that you are using? Well, it's not your browser of choice. That one is outside the model. It's HTTP, for example. That's the application layer entity. So you have a protocol there as well, not a piece of software that you use, but, an but a protocol that specifies how this application can communicate with an application in the other end of this, of this communication. So you interact with the software application and the software application interacts with the application layer that interacts with the presentation layer, that, that interacts with the session layer, that interacts with the transport layer, which interacts with the network layer, which, in, which interacts with the data link layer, 
which interacts with the physical layer. It puts this message on the wire, and then at the other end, it goes back up. So it's received at the physical layer, moved into the data link layer, moved to the network layer, moved to the transport layer, to the session layer, presentation, application layer, to your application, and then that application either provides some message on a screen or does something that it's programmed to do. Since there is no one here, it's very hard to take questions. And it's very, very hard to make a, a lecture like this the way I'm used to doing it. But I'm, I'm going to give a few minutes now for questions regarding these two parts, because I think actually we will stop here for today. Else we'll have nothing to talk about in the next scheduled le lecture. And based on the speed of this lecture, I think there should be lots of questions. Or maybe I should ask, uh, is there anyone listening? <laughs> yes, uh, we have <coughs> 30 or so listening, so. That's good. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of this information needs to sink in. Yeah. And hopefully the questions, we can start the next lecture with some questions. I think that's a good idea. We'll make a, a short recap of this and then we'll, uh, we'll take questions. And, and uh, hopefully you can post them beforehand so I can look up answers for them. Then we close for today and I hope to see you all on Wednesday.